message is we've forgotten how to blush. We've forgotten how to blush. And I can remember back, oh, some 30 years ago, David Wilkerson per, uh, preaching a message. We've forgotten how to blush. And so I will not preach what David preached. I may uh, steal a quote or two from him, but I have given him credit in the slideshow, okay? So, uh, but uh, I was there when he preached the message uh, like this on Jeremiah 6, and I really felt led to preach about this. And so I just took his title. <laughs> so anyway, we forgot how to blush. But that's, I think it's a good uh, depiction. Before I read this first slide, I want to read this to you. Uh, this was last week's message, and I talked about how the works of the flesh manifest, or how they, they, they show themselves. If they're in our life, the works of the flesh, they will manifest. Now I'm talking about God's people. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about us. And so he preached... Paul preached against the work of the flesh in Galatians. And he was talking not necessarily about our freedom in Christ as much as he was talking about our liberty in Christ. Uh, to, to, to promote freedom is anything goes. But to promote liberty means that we're living in a way where we're influencing others and helping others. And so that, there's a tie to that. And so the scripture talks a lot more about liberty than it does about freedom. And so does our Constitution, by the way, in the United States. But anyway, he was talking about how the works of the flesh will manifest, and uh, they will manifest in all these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. And I went through the whole list last week, defined them. But the word lasciviousness, I have it underlined there, as you can see up on the screen, that really, that really got my attention. Because it, 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 lasciviousness is... What brings that about in our life as a work of the flesh is immodesty. Immodesty. And today we live in a generation of immodesty. We, we, uh, we've come to church this morning. You've probably seen two or three billboards that were very immodest. Uh, of people on billboards. And maybe you saw a commercial this morning or heard even something on the radio that was... Uh, you know, something that wasn't spoken in, in, in modesty. But in any event, you get the idea. And so we live in a generation right now, very immodest. They've forgotten how to blush. We've forgotten how to blush. Uh, I'll get into this uh, in just a minute on how we've forgotten how to blush. But anyway, I want to read Jeremiah 6, 15 to you this morning, uh, which Israel is uh, very close to going into captivity. Uh, the northern kingdom's already in captivity when Jeremiah preaches this. Southern kingdom is going to go into captivity, going to go into Babylon, but he's trying to warn the people. Uh, he's a prophet. He's a, he's a I would call a, 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 a nationwide, a national prophet speaking to the land. And he says this in verse 15 uh, before they are taken into captivity. Were, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Was there shame in their life? And he, said, he answered the question. He says, no, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Nor did they know. And the girl on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see she's got her hand over her face and she's blushing a little bit. Well, that's part of it. But that's not all of it. I'm going to define blushing in just a second. Uh, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall what? Fall among the fall, those who fall at the time I punish them. All right, So they're going to go into captivity. They are going to fall. Falling in this case means they're going to fall into captivity. All right, Not going to fall away from the attention of God, but they're going to fall into captivity into a foreign land where God is going to have to teach them. He's going to have to teach them humility. He's going to teach, have to teach them how to blush again and to be a modest people. And to be a humble people. And so, uh, I don't know if you uh, use this term or not, but I remember back in high school uh, when somebody, like on the football field or on the basketball court, would make a mistake on the other team, we'd all get, stand up in the, in, the, in the stands and go, Beat Red! Beat Red! <laughs> and we just chant that. Beat Red! Beat Red! Like, you should be embarrassed for doing a play like that for... Letting the, you know, kicking the ball out of bounds or something like that, you know. And so it's an, an embarrassment. And a lot of times 
There are so many things in the kingdom of God that the children of, of Almighty God, I will call you the Israel of God because that's what Paul calls you. He calls not only calls you Christians, not only calls you uh, believers, but he calls you the Israel of God. So there are people that are, are proclaiming that they're the Israel of God, but they're walking around in immodesty in a lot of different ways. And so, you know, it doesn't matter, folks. It really doesn't. If you've got tattoos of scriptures up your arm, maybe you have one tattoo to your forehead, maybe you've got this really bold Christian t-shirt, but I want to tell you something. What comes out of your mouth, what comes out of your life is much more important to God than what you wear. And so if there's some immodesty coming out of your mouth, I want to tell you the truth. This is not legalism. All right? Mm -hmm. This is the truth. Because there's a lot in the scripture about speaking profane things coming out of your mouth. If you're a believer, you can have victory over that. I'm going to say it again. I don't care if you hit your thumb with a hammer. Amen. And you just have to say that word. No, you don't. This isn't legalism. You've just forgotten how to blush. Are you with me? So Jeremiah on our timeline, and if you don't know where we are on the timeline, I might be able to see it. We're right, right there in that little circle. See where I got the little dot? Uh, the cat's the cat's going to run off the wall after. Okay, those of you with cats. So this is uh, Jeremiah on our our uh, our timeline here, and you see he's got sackcloth and ashes on, because he's grieving over the people. He's grieving over what they've become. They've become immodest. They've become uh, they've forgotten how to blush. They've forgotten so many things. And, and God is saying, you know, I, I love these people. I don't, I'm not going to leave them in their sin. I'm going to deal with them. I'm going to try to pull them out. It's just like the hardship that we have to go through right now. It's, it's, it's amazing how many people are beginning to wake up now. You know, two years ago I said, a church is asleep. Now, I, I don't know. I don't know that it's asleep. I mean, it's, some are sleeping. Yeah, you can hear them snoring. You know, but... A lot are waking up, praise God. And I'm excited about that. And, but yet, you see Jeremiah in sackcloth and ashes grieving over the fact. Right next to Jeremiah there, uh, to the right of Jeremiah, are two lines. And there are actually three on the timeline. I just cut one off with the picture. But that's Babylon, Israel, uh, excuse me, the southern kingdom went into captivity in three stages. So there are three lines down on that chart where they're uh, exiled into Babylon. And this is Jeremiah weeping because he wasn't, he wasn't exiled in the first uh, exile. So he's weeping in Jerusalem over the loss of all the people. And this is about the year 606 uh, B.C. And on our timeline it says, Daniel and his fellows and all the princes, he's quoting from Daniel, even though uh, Daniel was taken into captivity. Jeremiah's back in the land. Daniel, uh, Daniel it says this, Daniel and his fellows, all the princes and all the mighty men of valor and all the craftsmen and the smiths were carried away into Babylon. And that's in 2 Kings uh, chapter 24. So they're in exile. And, you know, God has, has certain people in exile right now. And God, is a, God will allow only what we allow, only what we allow to go on in our nation. Can, it, can you... Can I say amen to myself? Amen. 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 But seriously, he'll only allow what we allow. And if, you know what, we just lay back and allow it, it'll happen. Praise God. Amen. If we pull back a little bit from the slide, you can see those three bars I was talking about going down. That's the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom is over to the left, and they've already gone into Assyria, into exile and captivity. And so uh, this is a very troubling time for Jeremiah, but he puts his finger on the pulse and he, he reads the pulse and he says, this is why this is happening. This is why. So Israel was beginning to live in the flesh. We're not to live in the flesh. We have freedom from living in the flesh and liberty to express the glorious freedom of the children of God to those that are lost in this dying world. Amen? Now, 
So just a couple of points. I only have four points this morning. We might get out in time to be at the head of the buffet today. Mm -hmm. All right, Cracker Barrel is uh, taking reservations right now. You can be there in four and a half hours <laughs> if, we, uh, if we get done early. Praise God. Uh, so I'm going to read a statement to you. It's in that first verse. It's uh, highlighted, which says, Israel went from delicate to desolate. So in the midst of all that these people are doing, in the midst of the fact that they won't listen to Jeremiah, they're going to go into captivity. God is still expressing his heart. Jesus is expressing his heart. Because how many know Jesus was right there? Because he was. Amen? If you don't believe that, read the book of Hebrews, read the book of James, you'll find out that there was a rock accompanying Israel. That rock was Christ. So he was right there. But it's a statement. And, and I ask myself the question, number one, Point number one, what would cause the Lord of hosts to say and do all these things to his people? Or at least allow to happen, I'll say that. Allow to happen to his people. What, and it's this statement, this beginning statement, this is very, very troubling. Jeremiah 6, 2, we're in chapter 6, and I said we're going to be bouncing back from 6 to 5, 5 to 6, back and forth, so... Uh, I got all the scriptures up on the screen, but if you want to open your Bible and see where these are, that's fine too. Jeremiah 6 2 says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman. Now, men, I hope you're not offended by this because you're the Israel of God too. And, uh, you know, you're viewed by God as a lovely and delicate woman. All right? I can handle that. This is it's an endearing way of God to speak to me and say, as far as I'm concerned, Ed, you know, you're just a you're just a delicate, delightful individual. Mm. It's just some of the things, Ed, that come out of you <laughs> that I have a problem with. Okay, and so we're going to read that verse three. Now, everybody, uh, wax your mustache and, and make like a villain. Would you do that? Okay. Make like a villain. Yep. Little little uh, liberty there, but they, they were kind of doomed because they were doomed to go into captivity anyway. So there you go. Very good. All right. So here are the villains, the shepherds. All right. A lot of times we think, well, the Lord is my shepherd, Psalm, Psalm 23. So this must be the good guys, the shepherds, right? No, most of the time, if you read the book of Song, the Song of Solomon, the shepherds be, beat up the Shunammite woman. So the shepherds aren't always in the best of light in Scripture. And so it says, The shepherds, the villains and the barbarians, with their flocks shall come to her, and they shall pitch their tents against her all around. Each one shall pasture his, uh, in his own place. So it sounds like, oh, here come the peaceful shepherds. All right, now that's not what they were. All right? Verse 4, Prepare war against her. So these are warring shepherds. These will, these will abuse uh, the Israel. Prepare war against her, arise and let us go up at noon. Woe to us, for the day goes away, for the shadows of evening are lengthening. So they're saying, we don't have a lot of daylight, so we're going to attack at noon. We're going to come against her right in broad daylight. And beloved, isn't that the way the enemy is attacking right now? He's not doing it covertly. He's doing it in a broad daylight. Amen. He's doing it. And, and you can either do two, one of two things. You can either fight it, fight him, or you can you know, run away and hide. One or the other. But he's doing it right out in front of everybody. Right in the faces of our children. Right in front of the most impressionable. The most vulnerable. He's putting it out there. And he's putting it out there full time 24-7. So verse 5. Arise. And let us go by night. And destroy her palaces. So they've got a two-fold plan. They're going to do their sinister stuff. They're going to do their stuff in darkness. But they're also going to do it out in the broad daylight. So it's a kind of a twofold thing, a twofold attack that we see coming against us. Verse 6, for thus hath the Lord of hosts said. And that's why I got Lord of hosts. You all know what that means, right? The God of the Elohim, God of the angel armies. Uh, anyway, cut down trees, build a mound against Jerusalem. That's a siege work. 
That means they can besiege the city. They can go in, attack the city, even though Jerusalem had walls at the time. It uh, doesn't matter because God has sent an army. And this is an army of Babylon. It's a force. Uh, uh, not a force. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, reinforcements were coming from Egypt to help them. Reinforcements were coming from Assyria to help them. Sounds like a New World Order. It sounds like a, hmm, sounds like a, what did I have, Economic World Economic Forum or a UN. Yeah, they're coming for our coffee too. They're coming for, yeah, they want, that's right, Lori, thank you for saying that. They won't even want our coffee. That's supposed to cause global warming. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody helps the coffee cause You know, I guess you heat it up in the pot and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for these illustrations. They're really good. They are. But uh, we're not going to let that happen, right? Uh, no, we're not. Okay. Uh, so, build a mound against Jerusalem. This is the city to be punished. She is full of oppression in her midst. So, not only is oppression coming against her, but she's pretty good at oppression too. All right? And so we've seen, over the years in the church, we've seen disunity. We've seen this one talking about that one and so on and so forth. And, you know, I mean, if there's a time we've got to declare we're coming together. We're coming together. We're not going to let doctrines drive us apart and things like that. We're coming. We're, we're as one in unity. We're coming together. Verse 7. As a fountain wells up with water, so she wells up with her wickedness. So it's like a, a flowing spring. How many of you have seen a nice spring that just bubbles over and doesn't stop? People are blessed that have those springs anyway uh, but the violence instead of good things violence is plundering violences are plundering and hurt, hurting her before me continually are grief and wounds so he's going to give some instruction I've got those in gray too the instructions he says be instructed O Jerusalem lest my soul depart from you lest I make you desolate a land not inhabited and there it is from Delicate to desolate. Praise God. You know, if we just listen to the Lord, if we just obey His Scripture, obey His Word, you know, we could live in that those delicate, tender moments. But we think in the reality of life, in the in the struggle of life, you know, we've got to just toughen up, and uh, you know, even maybe use some of the weapons of the enemy's warfare against back at them and against them. And uh, this is not a fight fire with fire situation. Although the Bible does say these wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. Amen? So we have to have some wisdom in it. And so that's how the Lord sees us. And yet the, uh, the daughter of Zion, or the Israel of God, has become a prey of the enemy. So we do not want to fall into the enemy's hands. How do we do that? We resist by walking in the light as he is in the light. Amen? Amen. Now, number two. What is Holy Spirit blushing? Now, you may hear a little David Wilkerson coming out here. Okay? Because I remember him defining this. And so, we'll do it the same way. So, Holy Spirit blushing. Is that really a doctrine? Well, we're going to make it a doctrine today. (laughs) I'll say that. Holy Spirit blushing because it's a result of the Spirit of God in your life. The Spirit, how many of you know the Holy Spirit? We've heard it over the years. People have said the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. Now the Holy Spirit is tough, but the Holy Spirit doesn't hang around for a lot of nonsense. He gets grieved very easily. And that should be the same thing that happens to us when we see sin and darkness in our life. We should be grieved just like the Holy Spirit is grieved. I believe that is doctrine, the Holy Spirit being grieved, right? Do not grieve the Spirit of God who I've caused to live in you. Uh, Holy Spirit blushing is not just red cheeks from simple modesty. In the Hebrew, it is feeling wounded, ashamed, devastated, and grieved at the name and purity of Jesus Christ our Lord, that it has been trampled. There we go. There we go. What Jesus, you've invited Jesus in your heart, what he wants to do is make you just like him. 
He wants to, all those qualities, all those attributes that Jesus possesses, he wants you to possess without measure. That's what the job uh, and ministry of the Holy Spirit is. Okay? And so, to, uh, to, to, to partake in those things and to talk like the world talks and act like the world acts and uh, let your sensual appetites operate the way the world operates, all those things, it smears Jesus' reputation. We should blush. I don't want to cause my Lord that kind of uh, that kind of publicity that kind of uh, whatever you want to call it amen Ezekiel 9 4 says this look at this and the Lord said to him go through the midst of the city go through the midst of Gillette no the city through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. So there's a people of God that are, are literally going to see what, what is going on in the body of Christ and they're going to weep over it. Just like Jeremiah and his sackcloth. Okay, maybe we don't have fresh sackcloth to put on. But, you know, there's going to be a grieving, a crying in the heart. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to go through this with the Holy Spirit grieving also together and and he says what I want you to do is I want you to go through the city I don't want you to just notice who's grieving and wailing over what's going on and the, the backslidden condition of my people but I want you to put a mark on them you see they're the we have prayer this afternoon it's called special forces so God has his special forces that he puts a little mark on and he says, this, here's a man, he has my heart, he's got my, he's got my interest in his heart, and, and he's grieving over, in other places it says, mark those who cry over the ruin of Joseph. Joseph was one of the tribes that was also pulling away uh, from, from the things of God. And, you know, he says, Mark, I want you to mark, I just marvel at those people that are just crying and and seeking my face over the ruin of Joseph. And so, you know, we could put anybody's name in there, like uh, weep and cry over the, the ruin of, uh, of Gillette or whatever. So God, is, God has a special place and a special ministry for his people that he wants to bring them into. And, and, and throughout that and in that, he's going to protect us. All right? So it's a prophetic assignment uh, by God for Ezekiel to run through the city and to put a mark on everybody's head that grieves over the ruin of the people. And I want to read this to you too. Okay, Jeremiah 5, 1 to 3. Run ye to and fro throughout the streets of Jerusalem and see now and know and seek in the broad places thereof if you can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment. What does that mean? judgmental spirits or something like that, executed judgment, that seeketh the truth, so they're judging not of their own tastes and desires, but they're judging by the truth, right? And I will pardon it, and though they say the Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. So there's going to be a prophet that's going to run through the land. His name is Jeremiah. And, and he's going he's gonna to be speaking what God has taught, told him to speak. And they're going to say, they're, they're going to look at Jeremiah and say, Jeremiah, I'm a Christian. Look, I got a, I got a Jesus t-shirt on. I got a I pray hat on. I got me a, I got, look at these scriptures. I got tattooed on my arm, Jesus. Ah, there's 1 John 4, 7 and 8 right there. You know, I'm a Christian. You got to know it. And what does God say? Surely they swear falsely. Don't just go by that. They're leading. You lead with grief. You lead with grief. You lead with my heart is broken for the things that yours is broken for, Lord. But they have not grieved, right? That's what it says. Thou hast stricken them, 
right? They surely they swear falsely, O Lord. Are not thine eyes upon the truth? So they're saying one thing. The Lord's got his, his Old Testament and New Testament open saying, that's not in my word. The way you live, the way you behave is not in my word. Is that judgmental? No. Just going by what he's written. Jesus wrote a lot of things. I know that because they're read in my Bible. They're there for a reason. They're not there for us to turn our nose up and say, okay, we're at the buffet now. I'll take this scripture, but I won't take that scripture. But I'll take that one. Oh, that one looks like dessert. That looks good. Anyway, enough of the buffet. <laughs> Amen. We're going to get hungry. But they have not, what? Grieved. Look at that with me. They have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock, and they have refused to return. Why? Because they have an army of excuses. Because they've got an army of preachers on the internet that said, go ahead and do anything you want. You're still going to heaven. That's right. Go ahead and do anything you want. No, it's, it's okay. you got freedom. you got freedom. Well, you, <laughs> you have individual freedom, but you got liberty to, to concern yourself about. that The whole book of Galatians is written about that the Apostle Paul happened to put in Scripture. Amen? Are you with me? Yes. So a prophetic assignment to run through the city. So number three, point number three. If you didn't get point number two, it was what is Holy Spirit blushing? All right? So we've gone over that quite a bit, right? And we're just blushing in tandem with the Holy Spirit when we're doing that. Number three, what is the popular response to our perceived prosperity. Boy, that was a mouthful. So, how, how, how are we viewing our prosperity? Because, l let's face it, folks, we in this room have more than three quarters of the world's population. And yet, we live in some kind of a matrix. Now, I, I'm not trying to get weird on you, okay? But John's shaking his head up and down, so I know... But we do. We live in some kind of a matrix where we think, and I praise God for everything that he gives me. I praise God for every blessing. We prayed over the offering today and so on. There is a perceived prosperity in this nation and in this world that if it went the way of the Lord, if it went the way of the Ten Commandments, if the way, it went the way of God's finances and in the kingdom of God, there would be more. There would be more. What does the scripture say? John 10.10. 10. The enemy comes to what? First of all. Kill. Steal. Destroy. Kill and destroy. We'll take that first one. There's robbery out there against us. Alright? I won't get into that. Okay? But it's, it's proven. It's a fact. It's been going on uh, for a long, long time. And again, I won't give you a lesson on the Federal Reserve or the this or the that. But anyway, you all know it. You're smart. And uh, so what is our response, our, the popular response? Because in Israel at the time, Israel was prospering. Israel was doing well. And they were looking at that and they were saying, well, we're prospering. Lord, you're blessing us. You're, we're doing good. And you know, they were, they were blessed right till the time when they went into Babylon. You see what I'm saying? So don't go by your checkbook. Don't go by your finances. Don't go by the fact that I prayed and you know or whatever. Things are still going on, and we got to stand against those. See, so it says Jeremiah five two. So we're back in verse five, not in six. Neither shall evil come upon us. Neither shall we see sword or famine. Now this is not a prophetic word. This is just raw people giving the popular response to when a prophet comes to them and says if, if look if you don't if you don't follow the word of God you follow the scriptures so you're going to go into captivity you're going to have all this stuff just overwhelm you and overcome you you follow God and he will protect you but they laugh and they scratch they scratch their chin and they say no 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 it's not going to uh, we've got too much we've got too many flocks too many herds uh, we're, do, we're doing good. Leave us alone. 
And, and that was the response to Jeremiah. How'd you like to be a prophet and get that response? Uh, Jeremiah 5, 23 uh, and 24 says this, But this people hath a revolting and rebellious heart. What would make God say that through the prophet? Except that they had a rebellious and revolting heart. All right, so a revolting, the, 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 that's tied to that word revolution. He's saying there's some kind of a revolution in the Israel of God. And I don't like it. I don't like it. And it's a revolution of freedom. But it's not the freedom I've given. See what I'm saying? Neither say they in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God. Praise God. And the fear of the Lord is just looking at his word and obeying his word. It's not trembling that he's going to zap you or anything like that. Okay? Uh, look at this down below. Jeremiah 5, 27 and 28. That's a kind of middle paragraph. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Would, would you like him saying that about you? He says, you know where I, I really see it? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see it with you as public, in the public eye, as much as I see it in your house, in your home. He says, like a cage is full of birds, your house is full of deceit. Therefore, they are become great and waxen rich. It means they're they're getting they're getting more and more rich. The bottom line is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and yet they're full of deceit. They are waxen fat. They shine, yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. Notice that they overlook they overlook the deeds of the wicked, saying, Thou shalt not judge. Oh, right? When they shouldn't be overlooking the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless. Yet they prosper, and the right of the needy they do not judge. And that's where liberty comes in. Because where liberty comes in, it's not your personal freedom that it's what it's all about. It's about the fact that there are people in this world, people in the kingdom of God even, that are being abused. The most vulnerable people on the face of this earth are being attacked and overlooked. And it takes a people of God, a people with the heart of God, a people with knowing, knowing the, and understanding the heart of God to stand up for that. When you start to see... Well, we have rampant today children being abused, children being trafficked, uh, you know, the most vulnerable. What's happening with the elderly? Uh, what's happening with the servicemen? Lord, you asked for prayer for the servicemen, but what about the ones that have come back and, and, and we do hardly anything for them? Mm -hmm. Now we do nothing. We do yeah, nothing. we give it to the immigrants. Yeah. Don't we? We're giving it to the immigrants now. We're taking it from them and... You know, and I could get into a big rain rain, I'm not gonna do that, but you understand it's going on in the world. And and this is what we've got to stand. In. Not be we're not calling you to be political, we're just calling you to stand up against the you know, the, the, the ungodliness. Anyway, I have this highlighted in gray. Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem. This is Jeremiah six. We're flipping over to chapter six. Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem. Let, lest my soul depart from thee, and that was in the first slide, lest I make you desolate, a land not inhabited. So there you go, from endeared to desolate again. And that, that's the path. That's the path. And, and you know when you see your brothers and sisters going down that path, you, you've, got to, you, you've got to be concerned. Especially when it says their houses are full of deceit. So, uh, the last verse is Nehemiah. I want to read Nehemiah. I'll skip over to Nehemiah 9, 25, and 26. Because the same thing was going on. After they came back from captivity, they had the same attitude. They didn't learn. And that's why we have to learn. You know, we went through a pandemic. Did we learn from it? World Economic Forum is saying, you know, we've got uh, uh, disease X, they're calling it. It's a placeholder for whatever disease they want to concoct and come up with. Yeah, they're already planning on giving it to us. Yeah. I mean, have we learned or not? Yes, we have. All right. 
Amen. Amen. And so we're going to stand against it. Yes. What is the... So uh, let me just read the scripture. And they took... Uh, they took strong cities. This is coming back from Babylon. All right. The people took strong cities and a fat land and possessed houses full of all goods. Perceived prosperity, right? Wells digged. That's a good thing. Vineyards. Olive yards. I love olives. I would love one of those too. Fruit trees in abundance. So they did eat and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in thy great goodness. Right? Experiencing the goodness of God. He doesn't stop that blessing. He does it. And, and they're getting all excited about it. But yet, nevertheless, there's that word. See it in the middle there? Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind thy backs. There it is. The words of Christ cast behind their back. The words of Moses cast behind their backs. And slew all the prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee and they wrought great provocations. Alright? And there were people all around. You read the book of Nehemiah? Sambalat and Tobiah and all those other naysayers that were uh, just at the heels of Israel. And so we have these uh, governing groups and organizations constantly at our heels, coming against, you know who's the top of the radar uh, for the dark side to come against? Are the church and the Christians. Those that, that are following God. Those that will not listen to them. And that's from uh, the great, the great uh, prophet Nehemiah. Um, so, uh, Here's, a, here's my summary of uh, Jeremiah and what, what we've read so far. So no one could bring himself to believe that the prophet was speaking to him personally. You've got to take this personal. That's what I'm saying. You've got to take it personal. And I know there are a lot of people. I just watched two videos of, of prophetic people that somebody told me to watch or a couple of people told me to watch. And you know, none of them are local. So They live other places. They have strong words, but they live other places. They don't live in my backyard. And therefore, what God has done to remedy this, and I'll read you the verse to show you this. At the, look at the bottom of the slide. Therefore, God sets up watchmen over his people. Now, I want to tell you what the watchmen are. The watchmen are the local boys. The watchmen are concerned about grassroots Christianity 101, fighting the good fight of faith. All right? The prophets, they may be inspired by some of the prophets, but they understand the prophets are far away. The prophets can't grab you by the collar and pull you back. Okay? But God is going to have many watchmen in the land that you can allow to speak into your life if you will allow them to. And, and where you will not become hard-headed or stiff-necked or flint, what do they call it, flint-faced. <laughs> I don't want to be flint-faced. I like my soft skin. Thank you very much. All right. So many of the prophets we, we, we follow right now aren't right around the corner. But I want to tell you something. God has many watchmen. I used to love David Wilkerson. When you'd call David Wilkerson a prophet, he would say, I'm not a prophet, I'm just one of his many watchmen. And perhaps that was why, because he was so tender to people. He was tender to everybody. Amen? He's the most fiery man in the pulpit. You get to sit down and talk to him. He's the most tender man you'd ever come to know. How does that happen? Because he was a watchman. And because that's what we can be. We can be ten even though these wicked there are wicked people in the world, we can be the most tender hearted, loving, kind, strong individuals because we live the life that God wants us to live. One of his many watchmen. So what is the reason for God setting up watchmen over his people? And this is the verse in Jeremiah I want you to see. <coughs> Jeremiah six seventeen, because you know he said Jeremiah setting you up, but I'm also setting up watchmen in the land. He said, I also set up watchmen over you. Notice the word also. There are prophets, there are watchmen. 
I also set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. In other words, hearken to the sound of the prophet. Prophet's giving you a clear voice and a clear word. You're to echo the, you're to echo the prophet. And hearken, you're telling the people, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. So I want you to understand, your mission, that sounds like mission impossible, your mission should you decide to accept it. <laughs> I hope you do, because your mission will be to sound the trumpet. What's the trumpet? The Word of God. The Word of God, yeah. Right? You're not being judgmental. You're just speaking the truth in love. Amen? So, uh, I do have a quote from David. He says, There is a dignity in walking in holiness and purity. All right, just like that little delicate Israel, right? Walking in, in the beginning, walking in holiness. Following the Lord through a land not sown, like the Bible says. All right? Delicate. And all of a sudden, they become desolate. How did that happen so fast? He says, There's a dignity in walking in holiness and purity. A church that is overcoming the world has such dignity has such dignity. We are here to put a Holy Spirit blush on your face because of God's grief and hurt <coughs> and your sin. I'll tell you something. I, I stood on a platform when he said that. On a stage, on a Broadway stage in New York City when he said that. In the midst of the old New York City. And he said, with us standing there, we are here to put a Holy Spirit blush on your face. I still do that to this day. I'm here to put a blush on your face at the call of the world and some of these gruesome things that the world is trying to dictate to the church to do. Do you know that the, one of the most, the dark side, one of the most uh, high, highly exalted things to do with them is to put one of their members in as a pastor of a church? That's right. Amen. Infiltrated. So how do you know? I'm serious. How do you know who's who's speaking to you and what whether they're speaking the truth and whether they're a watchman or you know, or just a wolf in sheep's clothing? I'm telling you, this is serious. And this is the warfare. I put this scripture up on there because this is the warfare that we face. All right, we're not in Texas. Uh, we pray for Texas, but We've got a warfare going on here. It's for the souls of men. It's for the souls of God's people. And so that's, that's another important thing to look at. So what do we do? All right? It's always good to say, give me some practical things to do. Right? Uh, because these things are going on. What do we do? Number one, we're going to have to get much more serious about the things of God than we have been in the past. More serious. I mean, with Pastor, I pray all day. I talk to God all day. What do you want? Just a greater seriousness. There's room for a greater seriousness in my heart. I don't know about yours. And, and so to really look at, at things and begin to take them seriously and, and, of course, run them through the filter of the Word of God uh, and, and take a stronger, a stronger stance. Gird up your legs, right? Gird up your loins, like the Bible says. It's time to gird them up. Number two, we're to have, we're going to have to go beyond pointing to the sins of other people and confess our own failures to God. See, that's where the rubber is going to meet the road. You can see, and see, it's so easy to see the sins of others, but it's so difficult to see your own sins. And, uh, you know... I'm glad I have a wife because she helps me see my sins. <laughs> Better take it seriously or, you know, whatever. And, and so, you see, that. but again, we have discernment. I want you to know that. We, we're not enlightened people. We are discerning people. Amen? We don't know a couple little tricks here and a couple little tricks there. All we know is, the, is God. God, that's it. God, the Word of God, the things of God, the testimony of Scripture. And that's how we roll. And then number three, lastly, it's going to require a night and day vigilance against the enemy. So what does a watchman do? Watchman stands on the wall. 
when the enemy's coming, a watchman looks out. A watchman looks ahead. Amen. I believe in God to raise you up as watchmen. I'm not talking about you know ordained ministers. I'm talking about watchmen. What does a watchman do? He watches. But he doesn't just watch. He doesn't just stand on the wall and, oh, there's a nice wall. <laughs> oh, there's a nice moat there with an alligator in it. Look at that. Okay. He, 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 he looks out. He looks ahead. He, he sees a cloud of dust and a mighty hee-ho over the horizon. And he, he looks and he sees. He trains, he trains his senses for... You can do that with this, with this book. You train your senses for what, what's going on in the world, what's happening. And he looks out. And then, when the danger comes, he goes and gets the trumpet and blows the trumpet. You see, that, that's, that's where God is putting us right now. That's where we live in history. We don't live some other place. That's our moment in history. And we get the word out. We get the word of God out, the trumpet. And we sound the trumpet and we sound the alarm. This is where God is bringing us right.